Okay, so my name is Gavin Nielsen, which you all know, all two of you. <laughs> and uh, this week is geometric modeling, so we're going to do some stuff in SolidWorks. And uh, um, we're also going to talk about a few of the few of the uh, <clears throat> things that are easier to visualize doing geometric modeling. Um, we're now doing 11 times 2 hours because we skipped last week. And uh, I did rearrange on phase 4. <clears throat> we're kind of building the geometry and then controlling it with hydraulics and driving the, elect the hydraulics with electronics. So we're going to do hydraulic circuits next week, electronic circuits the week after that, and then the final seminar will make sure we actually play the game and see if we can hit something. You know, the big, uh, the big deal the last day. So today's agenda is really full. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff, but most of it is really just adding words and terminology to the stuff you probably already have some, some notion of. Uh, so we're going to talk about some interesting modeling concepts that they exist in all the stuff we've done so far. It's just a lot easier to talk about them and uh, show them off, I guess, in SolidWorks. Um, and then we'll talk about some specifics for SolidWorks. We'll kind of intersperse those two together so we can demonstrate the concepts. And then we'll uh, get some project work done and make a cannon barrel and make a turret and make a turret mount. And then we'll put all those together in an assembly. And uh, <clears throat> I think we'll probably skip the RLA Berk. Uh, I'm just going to show you guys how to import. You can go online and, you know, there's these model repositories and get all kinds of crazy things. And they had an Arlay Burke model. <laughs> so why do we want to draw it if we've already got one? Um, and then hopefully we have time, we can do some finite element analysis at the end, which is kind of interesting stuff and good. It's good to just see it done once or have a little bit of exposure to it. So that's the plan. So I really like this picture. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about dimension and scale here. And this is looking down the barrel of an Iowa class battleship. And that little guy right there is a sailboat, and that's a window of the sailboat. So you get much better, like this is what it would look like right before you got run over <laughs> by the battleship, right? Um, so this is looking at it from the side to just remind you, you know, that's how big the guns are in the scale of this monster. Um, and I don't know why they have, it looks like a, a V-22 Osprey landing on it. Know if they were actually in service when the battleship was in service, but whatever. Um, okay, so we want to start off talking about dimensions, and that you know this is a logical thing. We've talked a lot in MATLAB and Simulink uh, world about different dimensions and sizes of things, um, and we've talked about scalars being zero dimensional and vectors one dimensional. And we did the sound example, and then we did matrices two dimensions, and we did images and 3D arrays, right? <clears throat> so in SOLIDWORKS, um, and, and more generally in geometric uh, modeling type of programs, a point and a vertex, a point or a vertex is kind of a good zero dimensional thing to talk about. It doesn't have width, depth, it doesn't, you know, it's a point. Um, a line or a curve is a good one dimensional thing. Um, profiles, faces, and surfaces. Okay, this you guys already know, right? Three-dimensional objects, bodies, and positions in time of those bodies you could think of as four-dimensional. Um, I highlighted and bolded the matrix and the profile, face, and surface because, um, and why do we work in 2D so much? This is just what I've observed. Um, there's probably a really good mathematical reason for that. Um, and I did a little reading I haven't taken any topology courses. I have a few books on it that I've read, but um, we're going to talk a little bit about topology. But 2D and 4D in topology are kind of special dimensions. And so I'm not, I, I can't answer for you the specifics of why 2 and 4 are such interesting numbers as far as dimensions go, but apparently they are. And when we get into SOLIDWORKS a little bit, and if you mess with it a little, you'll find you'll spend most of your time either in sketches, which are 2D sketches or uh, mating parts, which, which happens in 3D. So that's just a little bit of crossover. Okay, so uh, if we think about higher dimensions, so this is a, a tesseract, um, and I really like this animation because it, it 
kind of shows what, uh, oh, come on, man, keep going. I don't know why that's, I'll go back and forward. Um, in a higher dimension, how you could rotate something that is higher dimension and project that back into three dimensions, which I think is pretty wild. Um, on, the, on the right here, we're, we're showing um, kind of a neat animation of showing how from each lower dimensional object, how you project out to these higher dimensional objects. You start with a point, projects out to a line, so you're like, you might think of it like integration almost. And that projects out to a square, which projects out to a cube. Um, and we can see how we can, you know, we can kind of relate this back to MATLAB, scalar, vector, matrix, 3D array, 4D array. So I'm trying to prove the point. These are really our, we're not talking about something different. This is just modeling. And this happens to be geometric. OK, so now we've talked about dimensions. And dimensions you might think of as the space. Did I, yeah. I didn't actually say this. Uh, in MATLAB and Simulink, we usually think about these things as like the depth of an object, or in a, in a, in a certain way, like this, the complexity. In SOLIDWORKS, we kind of think of it as like the space that we're talking about. They're really, if you, if you stop and ponder that a little bit, it's kind of the same thing. So once you're in a space, it's kind of natural to talk about degrees of freedom. And um, sometimes people say, oh, you know, six degrees of freedom, that's as high as I get. You know? You have three dimensions, and you can rotate on any of those axes, and so that must be the top. But really, more generally, degrees of freedom in modeling uh, is a number, each of a number of independently variable factors affecting the range of states in which a system may exist. So you could think of if you have a line, um, <clears throat> and maybe one side is anchored, and you can change the, the length of that line, the degrees of freedom of that model is one because you can change the length of the line. Um, or for, for us, for our canon, we have two degrees of freedom because we can change what our bearing is and we can change what our elevation is. And so that's the thing we're controlling. But um, systems, like especially software systems, have just a ridiculous number of degrees of freedom. And complex mechanical systems do too. Uh, typically, they're natural numbers like you know positive integers but they can be fractional too, and that's where fractals, that's what fractals are about, is fractional dimensions. Um, they're super common and they're all over the place. If you're looking for them, they're just a lot more complicated to talk about. So um, I thought this was kind of interesting. The number of degrees of freedom in the human hand, just, just amazing. I mean, from a mechanical standpoint, that there's really more because it's hard to capture some of the ways that you know, you have these kind of live joints that can stretch. So it's harder to uh, say it's exactly 24, but at least 24 degrees of freedom just in one hand. Um, and you could think of each joint that can rotate as there's a degree of freedom. And so, you know, they start out at your fingertip, and one, two, three, and then can they go side to side? And you can see this, this little video is showing, you can, you can see how the knuckles are changing distances from each other. And, that's actually really complex. Um, and so the state of the hand isn't just where it sits in space or how it's rotated in space, but really all about its shape and those things. So um, that's kind of a neat thing, I, I think. So we're going quickly here. <clears throat> you guys with me so far? I think it's, it's probably review. I'm just putting some names on things. Um, so now we're going to talk about constraints. So now. We have a space to work in that's of a certain dimension. And we have these degrees of freedom that can move in those dimensions. So we, as practical people, need a way to make it do what we want it to do or specify something. Or, um, so the way we do that really is through constraints. Um, and <clears throat> in, in SOLIDWORKS, they're actually called constraints. But more generally, you could think of as saying, you know, if if you have a, uh, um, a gain block in Simulink and you put five in that gain block and connect things through it, you're constraining that as something that will multiply its input by five and take that to the output. And that's a type of constraint, a way to not make it do anything but do something specific. 
So formally, I guess I'd, I'd look at this as like a working definition, um, but it's a condition on or a relationship between components of a system that eliminates degrees of freedom. So let's say you, you had that line, and maybe, you, maybe there, there are two points in the line, right? So really, it, and if you're working in one dimension, it, it kind of has two degrees of freedom. Where's the starting point, and where's the ending point? Well, if you fix one side, then you've eliminated one of those degrees of freedom, and now you have one free degree of freedom. Okay, and so uh, that's what we say is, is underdefined. That the total degrees of freedom of the, of the system are greater than the constrained degrees of freedom. So if it's overdefined, in other words, you can't solve it. There's no real solution. Then the constraints are way more than uh, the total degrees of freedom. And if it's perfectly defined, totally defined, um, or fully defined, that means they're equal. Does that make sense? Yeah. So in SolidWorks, kind of like I was mentioning, it's, it's kind of the workhorse of SolidWorks is 2D sketches. And so you start a 2D sketch on a plane or a face and or some kind of planar surface, and then you put elements in there like points or lines or arcs or whatever you want to draw. Um, but this is an open question. I want to ask you guys, how many degrees of freedom are in this sketch? So we're looking at a plane, and we've drawn these connected four lines. So looking at this, how many degrees of freedom does that sketch have? Guesses are okay. Why, why eight? Eight. There's two points in each line. Yeah, there's eight. That's eight. That's right. And, and another way you could think about that, that's, that's perfect. And another way you could think about that is that uh, there are four points, and each point can move in two space. So we have eight, eight degrees of freedom in the system. So the question is, we, we have this, now how can we constrain it? And so we can constrain it using it, uh, what's called geometric or dimensional constraints. And so here, I'll, I'll demonstrate this in just a sec. We locked the, uh, this point to the origin. So that eliminated two degrees of freedom, x and y for that point. And then we said this needs to be vertical. This is horizontal. This is vertical. This is horizontal. So there was two, three, four, five, six. And then we gave it two dimensional constraints, seven, eight. Now it's a fully defined sketch. And so when you're, when you're drawing stuff in SOLIDWORKS, and I'll, I'll do this right now actually, um, you, the sketch is blue when it's underdefined and black as, as soon as it's fully defined. So you kind of run around adding constraints until you've fully defined it. Um, and it's, it's really a neat, way, <clears throat> a neat way to think about that and visualize what's going on. Because as you're building a software system or anything, anything you're modeling, you're really running around putting constraints on it, trying to you know, if you think about what a circuit is, it's constraining, like an electrical circuit, it's constraining the path of electrons in a certain way. Um, so let's do this real quick. Um, so I'm in, I'm in SOLIDWORKS here. I just opened it up. I'm going to click on the new document and start a new part. There's, there's three types of uh, documents inside SOLIDWORKS parts, assemblies, and drawings. So I'm going to start a new part. And then... We start out, and all we all we start with is a little bit of reference geometry. So three planes and an origin. Um, so I'm going to click on the front plane, and I'll make these bigger, large buttons. So I'm going to start a sketch on that front plane, and then it, it automatically switched me over to the sketch toolbar. Okay, so I'm going to kind of um, make that same figure. Okay, so this is, this is kind of that same figure we had, the fully unconstrained sketch. And I can drag this around and see its degrees of freedom. But if I imply, okay, can you see, I don't know if you can see very well, but the dot is black and the, the lines are blue. Um, and if I try to drag this, you can see this right here is the constraint. If now I can drag this, but it only 
drags in a certain way. So if I make it, if I put a vertical constraint on it, so now the line went black. So I can run around and make this horizontal, make this vertical, oh, horizontal I mean. And now with this, here, here's my degrees of freedom that are left, right? How many are left? Two. So if we added two, huh? Okay. Well, which ones are they, or how do you figure? I count one, two, three, four, five that we have. So there should be three. So let's see if, if we, we know that if we added making this vertical and then two dimensions, that would be, that would fully constrain it. Maybe we can do it a little bit different way. Um, you're right, there's two here, but that's related to this one. That's why it's, it's tough to look at this and just say, oh yeah, three especially when it gets harder than a square, right? So, um, okay, so we'll fully constrain this. I just want to uh, show you guys that it goes black. Um, and then if I add, these are called smart dimensions. Um, I can click on an entity and just drag and drop over somewhere. I'll make it five, let's say. And maybe I'll make this one six. And so you'll notice I'm driving the sketch with the dimensions. So what I'm doing is uh, SolidWorks uh, parlance, I guess you'd say. You're encoding design intent in right now. And what I care about is the length and the width. And that way, this is kind of like the same way you'd, you'd mask a subsystem in Simulink and put the parameters in that you want. And everything else is hidden from you kind of using ge geometric constraints the same way. So, okay, so we can add, <clears throat> we did, we added some geometric constraints, uh, we added some relationships, and we got it to go all the way black, so now it's fully defined. Um, but before we go further with that, I, I just want to step back for a second. We're kind of going to be zooming in and zooming out all, all evening. Um, just think about this with the concept of degrees of freedom and constraints, and think about engineering requirements and specifications. Because if you think of, you know, let's just say that your major is electrical engineering, and let's say that somebody wants you to design a circuit, and they give you requirements for that circuit. Those are sort of constraints around the problem, right? Of It has to do those things. But the design space, hopefully, gives you some room to pick something. Hopefully, because if it doesn't give you any room, then you don't even have enough room for tolerances, like you know, plus or minus five percent resistors. Or you know, if they're so exact, then it's impossible to hand them something that meets their requirements. But as long as they give you sort of a, a boundary that's reasonable, then you can hit those um, requirements. And so, specifications is sort of a statement of what your the the statement of the states, I guess, is the way to say it, of your design. But that is um, something within the design space of the requirements. Does that make sense? So we were in the broad scope of all electrical circuits and then scoped that down to constraints of requirements of the problem, and that's our design space. And then we, we chose certain parameters, certain ways to do something, and that's our specification. So I just think it's good to kind of think of it that way, because sometimes, um, especially when people don't understand what a requirement's for, um, they may not think about how hard something is to do and they'll give you something impossible. And if, if you can kind of keep these things in the back of your head of, hey, you know, talk to your client, you've totally over-constrained the problem, I can't solve this. Like, let's talk about the real thing, what do you really need? So. <clears throat> I think that's really useful, and I've had that conversation a bunch of times with people. <laughs> like, oh, okay, you know, do you really have to have it that flat or that?
that fast or whatever it is, that strong. Okay, so now we have a sketch. <clears throat> and sketches are like, we're, we're, we're switching back and forth now, we're back in SOLIDWORKS land. Um, sketches are, are kind of the, the clay and we're gonna make bricks with them, um, almost literally. So they're the basic building blocks of what SOLIDWORKS calls features. So if we switch back over here, we have this fully defined sketch, and we can switch to the features tab, and there's a number of different options here. So I'm gonna click on extruded boss base, and now I can take that sketch and extrude it out, and <clears throat> now I have a piece of 3D geometry. Um, and that's, okay, and that, that feature there that we just made consumes the sketch. So there's a sketch within the feature, and it, it kind of hides it. It's almost like a subsystem. Um, so we don't have to go back and look at all that again. Now we just have a body, and we can do different things with it. So there's lots of different features, and uh, since we're being so ambitious, we're not going to go into a whole bunch of them, but we'll do a couple of them. Um, <clears throat> so what we just did was a geometry addition thing of extruded boss base, but we can also do a revolve. And that's where you have a center line and you revolve a sketch around something. You think of like a, a pin or some machined part, you know, that goes in a lathe. Those are good, good ideas to revolve those. Um, a sweep, which would be something like you have a profile and then you have a path that it follows to sweep something out. Uh, maybe you have some snake looking thing and you want to sweep a hexagon along the snake to make some complex geometry. And lofts, uh, lofts are like a series of different profiles. Maybe you want to go from a hexagon to a square to a circle, and it kind of morphs through them. That's what a loft is. And you can do all the same things, whether you're adding geometry or subtracting. So there's cuts and there's boss bases. Um, and then there's things where you can manipulate the geometry, like adding fillets and chamfers to kind of chisel things out. And there's a lot more to SOLIDWORKS, but that's kind of the nuts and bolts of it. Um, so, we just did the boss extrude. Um, so, we're jumping in quickly, but I, I, I wanted to get you wet and then show you where the shore was here. So, we're, we're going to jump back and forth. Um, so, where we just were, here's the geometry area. Um, number two is, these are out of order, I think. Oh, it's pointing out of the line, but it's pointing out this part right here, the sketch that we made first. Um, and then three was that feature we added based on the sketch. Or four is the feature manager tab up here, properties tab, configuration tab, and there's other tabs, but those are the most important. Um, so when you're looking here in SOLIDWORKS, um, you can look at different properties of things, like maybe you click on that, that. And there's properties of that dimension that you can see in the properties tab. And configurations are for things like maybe you want the big block and the little block. And so you store parameters so it can switch between big blocks set of parameters and small blocks set of parameters. Does that make sense? So that's that's kind of the layout of the land there. Any questions? I'm not trying to go too fast, but you won't be bored tonight. It's, we're going to go fast. So. Okay. All right, so zooming out again, um, more broadly, what's the rest of this stuff? Um, and if you've used, uh, you, you guys have used Windows programs before, most of this stuff's pretty basic. Um, but number one, it's a rollback bar, which we'll demonstrate. You can kind of go back in time with that because you make features in a certain order. Um, number two is the command manager tabs, which I don't know why SolidWorks calls it something different. Everyone else just calls it ribbons or tabs, but whatever, that's what they call it. Um, three are all the command manager buttons, so um, up here, all these buttons there. Uh, four is the regular menus. Sometimes that's not pinned, so you have to hover over a section to expand it out. Number five is, you know, your standard menu, open, save, new, all that stuff, print. Um, this looks kind of familiar, right, from Simulink, the little gear. It does exactly the same thing, it sets options. Um, and then there's... More, a place for more buttons, and this is kind of neat too. You can type in a command, and it'll actually, hey Ren, 
Um, you can type in a command here, and it'll actually find the command for you, which is just kind of a neat thing. So you know, you know it's it's called this, but you can't remember where it's buried in some menu. So <clears throat> that's kind of the layout of, of SolidWorks. Okay, so we now have a cube, and we've extruded a fully defined sketch and uh, constrained all the degrees of freedom, made it a three-dimensional body. Um, but let's add some more features because it's kind of boring like it is. So we'll create a new sketch, and now we're going to, uh, <coughs> this is SolidWorks. Um, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> my, uh, my roommate used to be a mechanical major before he switched to manufacturing, so I used to see him play around with it all the time. Oh, nice. Good. I've got a basic understanding. Okay, cool. All right, so <clears throat> now we could start on one of those reference geometry planes, but I want to start on a, a bit of geometry that we just created as a reference. So I'm going to click on this this face here, and this little fly out is this, this sketch button. It's the same thing as clicking on this. So now we're inside a sketch, and you can see it created at the two-dimensional origin up here. And then I'm going to click the normal two button, just so that we can look down directly on it. Okay. So we're not going to do anything crazy here. Um, we're just going to make a single hole. <clears throat> okay. Now, again, how many degrees of freedom do we have here? Does a circle have? Huh? How come? X, Y. Good. So we can move the, the circle and these two dimensions and we can change its size, right? Okay, so <clears throat> let's add some dimensional, uh, actually we'll do something interesting here. We'll use a construction line, hover over this edge and say I want to keep this thing centered, so that one's on the center point, and then we'll make this thing vertical. Okay, so now we eliminated one degree of freedom, right? And now it's centered, but it can still go up and down. It can still expand in and out. So now we have two left, and we'll use the Smart Dimension tool to dimension off of that edge to that. We'll just say this is three, <coughs> and the diameter will be two. Okay. So now we have this fully defined sketch. Um, I'll. Uh, um, before it's fully defined, so notice before it's fully defined, the center point is black because it can't move the center, but the circle itself is blue because we can change the diameter. So I'll put that back on here now, too. And now everything is black. All right, so now we're inside a sketch. We want to add another feature based on this sketch. So we could add a, another boss base, but I want to cut stuff out this, so we'll add an extrude cut. And um, there are different uh, parameters, like we just we just drag the block to a particular length. But we can say I want it to be exactly two inches, you know, and that would go part of the way through. Um, we can also be a little smarter about it and say I want it to go through all, no matter how big you are. So that's what I want to do this time, just to make sure, no matter how I change other parameters that will always cut all the way through. Okay, so now I have a hole. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna save this real quickly. And I'll put it in there. Call this the block. Okay. So, let's see. Constrained the sketch. Uh, we constrained it a little bit different than on this. This one I used three dimensional constraints, but same same basic principle. Um, now after the cut, we want to think a little bit about the dependence. We'll talk more about dependence in a little bit, but just just think with me. This isn't rocket science. If we didn't have the geometry to cut out, we couldn't have made the cut. So the cut is dependent. The cut feature is dependent on the boss base feature right before it. 
So if you deleted the boss base feature, you couldn't have a cut. Um, and I know that sounds like bonehead, yeah, I get it, but it's amazing how many things in SOLIDWORKS will break because you do something like that. You'll, you'll delete this thing that's before it and then wonder why the sketch is broken. Um, so that's, that's a big deal inside SOLIDWORKS. So that kind of leads us to dependence and mapping. Um, and this is, again, this is not something new. This is, I'm just, just giving it a name in modeling parlance or, or terminology. Um, it's one, models, one model features definition uh, or reliance on a separate, quote, previous uh, feature solution. And you can think of this like, <clears throat> you remember our, our coastal defense lead time algorithm um, where it was dependent uh, the lead time was dependent on our range, but our elevation depended on, remember, how there was like the circular reference and they both had to solve and they were both solving. Um, so that's a good, good example of dependence. Um, but we can think of the cut features dependence on the geometry that it was cutting to. And mapping, it's another one of those, like, man, that's bonehead. Of course it's mapping. We, we put the sketch on the face. And so when the sketch goes to solve itself, it's first going to look for the face and figure out, okay, this is where I am now. And now I can start creating the sketch and going off of these edges. So it has to be able to map those edges so it can start and, and solve its solution. Um, so it's a little bit like a function in the sense of a mathematical function, like it takes an input and gives an output. It, it's a mapping. Uh, but this is important to think about um, in SOLIDWORKS from just, just from a, a theoretical standpoint, and it, it solves so many of the issues that people run into thinking they need to be experts in SOLIDWORKS. You don't really need to. If, you, if, if that's what your job is, fantastic, but some of this stuff saves you hours of trying to solve model problems. Um, you can think of other mapping examples like a gain block we were talking about. It takes an input, maybe the gain is a five, so it takes the input, multiplies by five, spits out an output, that's just mapping. It's mapping an input to an output. Okay, so we're going to add a shell feature this time. And this doesn't require a sketch, so it's a little bit different than the other ones. Um, so shell just takes the geometry. And I'll show the, I'll turn the preview on here. And so we can turn the shell thickness up, kind of get the idea of what it's doing here. Um, let me change so you can see. Well, that doesn't really help. Basically, it's, it's going to create new geometry. Is that yellow area in the side that's kind of hollow? Yeah. Right. So as you look down, there's, there's some walls right there. These are walls. So we're setting this wall thickness. Um, so if I hit OK, it doesn't look like it changed at all. But when I change the display type to like hidden lines visible, now that, that makes more sense. OK, so now we've got these features, and <clears throat> they're in a certain order. We did a boss, and then a cut, and then a shell. But um, both the cut and the shell are dependent on the boss, right? But the shell is not dependent on the cut. And so SOLIDWORKS is kind of neat. Um, I think most MCAD type of programs can do this now, but when they first came out with it, I think they were the first, to let you reorder features, and it's just drag and drop. So if I want to say I'd like to do the shell right after the boss, I can do that, just drag it and drop it. Now look how the geometry changed. Because there wasn't a hole to shell around, it shelled first and then cut it out. So. When I started learning uh, this stuff, um, I'm not trying to date myself or pretend I'm older than I am, but um, SOLIDWORKS w wasn't really that popular. And I started in uh, Mechanical Desktop, which was uh, sort of like an add-in to AutoCAD. And all of the geometry stuff you had to do with Boolean operations. Um, well, Mechanical Desktop was the first one that you could add features, but it was, it was very, very clunky. And, uh, and so you'd like say you'd have this square before mechanical desktop, you'd have this square, 
And then if you wanted to cut something out of it, like this hole, you'd create another, um, like a cylinder, and then do a Boolean subtract. So take the square and subtract the cylinder, and now you have a block with a hole. So being able to just draw a sketch and change parameters is so, so time consuming. And I remember when I first talked in 2000, in 1999, and I remember talking to the SolidWorks rep and saying, can I do this, can I do this? And I was like going down a list of things that took me hours. He's like, yeah, you can reorder features. Yeah, you can, it's like, okay, well, you know, it was one of those, I, I thought some of those answers would be no. And <laughs> anyway, uh, that's when I started using SolidWorks and it's, it's always fun to, to play with it. Uh, any questions? Just cruising along? Okay. All right, so we add the shell. <clears throat> um, are we aiming towards a, like a, a specific structure that we're building here, or are we just? Uh, not yet, we're, okay. we're going to. Um, so, uh, oh, we, already, we already did this, showing the different display states. So, change it from shaded with edges to hidden lines visible. And we just did the reordering. Okay, so uh, the back in time business, I know this is corny, but I think it's fun to the pictures of. Um, <clears throat> sometimes you realize, oh, whoops, I forgot to do something. And, and like maybe, maybe you, uh, before you shelled, you, you wanted to add a little boss or something like that. Okay, so you can drag this little line and go back in time. And now this is the geometry back in time. It's pretty cool. So now uh, I could do something like this. Um, I'll start a sketch there, and I'm not gonna constrain this. Um, I'll just leave it unconstrained. Say okay, and uh, I'll just let it pop up a little bit like that. That looks good. Okay. So now, if I go back forward in time, let's look at what this looks like. So I'm going to, I'll turn on instant 3D so I can pull this out. So now this little volume actually Wrong arrow. Actually comes up into, um, might be easier to look at it this way. We'll do a, this is the section view. Isn't that cool? So it's simple stuff, but you'd be amazed by how many figures you're trying to draw that end up at the end, being really complicated, where you're just drawing circles and squares and cuts and bosses, and arcs, you know, revolves. So that's uh, going back in time. <clears throat> oh, forgot. We got to break something. Okay. Um, so I'm going to delete this, and I'll delete the sketch too. Now. If you had gone back in time and decided to put that where the uh, hole is now, what would that hole would have to that? Oh, uh, I can do that real quick. So <clears throat> they're saying if I wanted to put this, like maybe yeah. something like that. Okay. Um, so if I delete that, and I'll delete this too, and this time I'm going to go back in time, and I'm going to chop the top off of this thing. Maybe, maybe I have a good reason to make it look like this. I don't know why I do, but okay. So I'm going to do an extrude cut. I'll say, I'm going to get rid of it through all of everything. So now the top no longer is, is, is a different face. 
and try to roll this forward. The shell works fine, but the cut's like, hey, that's where I was. <laughs> I was sitting on that face. And you just chop the, you know, chop the legs out from underneath me. And so when you hover over this stuff, it says, this sketch contains dimensions or relations to model geometry, which no longer exists. OK. And so this is, this is the name of the game of drawing stuff in SOLIDWORKS is establishing dependencies, resolving dependencies, going back in time, going forward in time. That, that's what you do all day. Um, so, okay. Uh, the fact that this is this way, I think I will just leave right there. I don't, well, I'll show you how to solve it or how to fix it. Um, we are in a little bit of a rush, but it's okay. So we see that, oh, we had this dimension to an edge that got deleted. And so it's now brown because they call it dangling. So if I click this and delete it, now that's not dangling anymore, but you can see there's also a midpoint relationship, which is also dangling. So I need to get rid of that. Now I want to delete the relationship, not the point. So I'll click on the relationship. So now it's back, um, and I could say, because everything's, no, nothing's dangling anymore. I could say OK. It says, well, there's still some issues with that, though. I just said, go ahead anyway. It said, well, but I don't have a sketch plane. OK. Um, so if I go back in here, I can change the sketch plane this is on. I just right clicked on it. So I'm going to say, edit sketch plane. See, it has this missing face because we deleted the face. So I'll delete that and I'll just put it on the bottom. And it's going to say, hey, I tried to go that direction, but there's nothing there. Okay, the sketch resolved, but the feature didn't. So I can go into the feature, and I really just need to turn it around. Go the other way. And now it's resolved. Make sense? Okay. So that leads us to our next topic, topology. Um, and I don't know what it is about the word. You guys know I like words. Topology is a cool word. Um, it's the study of geometric properties and spatial relations unaffected by continuous change of shape or size of figures. And um, when I asked, I, I tried to take it when I was here. And every time I'd sign up for it, they'd offer it. And then no one else would sign up, and then they'd drop it. And I'm like, dang it, every single semester I tried to take it. I couldn't take it. Um, but when I asked a professor who that was kind of her uh, specialty or her focus, she said it's, it's talking about why a teacup is the same as a donut. If you stop and think about that, how you can pinch and pull and distort a donut, you could pinch it around so that the handle of the teacup is the hole of the donut and then make a hole in part of the tor toroidal part of the donut, right, to hold the tea. So parametrically, uh, topologically, they're the same type of figure. And so <clears throat> you can think of it also as the topology, like people talk about network topology. Um, have you guys ever heard of that? Like you know, computer engineering, computer science, network topology. Um, but another way to think about it is the way in which constituent parts are interrelated or arranged. Um, so it's, it, we're not talking about something that has nothing to do with simulating still. There's still topology in, in that. It's just really hard to visualize. So why do we care about all this stuff? Well, because within SOLIDWORKS, geometry can have parametric changes, like changing sizes and hole positions and all that kind of stuff. And without making topological changes, and then it's golden. But as soon as you start screwing with the topology of the system, SOLIDWORKS needs you to go back and do the remapping. And that's what we just did. So, um, <clears throat> so I, uh, I wanted to be able to talk while I was doing this, so I decided to just record the video and talk you through it. So we've already seen this once, make a square, and we're not even going to dimension it, so it has lots of degrees of freedom. Now we're going to extrude that and pull it out and make uh, a figure with it, a body. Um, but we want to be able to think about what, what's the difference between a topologically equivalent figure and one that's not. not. 
And so here we're changing the size of that hole by dragging it around and changing the position of that hole. And you'll notice that we can't go past the boundary. Because if we did, you can think of it as like, oh, the faces, I can't map the same faces to something else the next time, like between solutions of this parametric change. So as I'm changing these sizes, between solves, I could tell you that this is the same face it was last time. Does that make sense? Like this face is still the same kind of face. It's still got four sides, and it still happens to be the top one in the, in the part. Okay. As opposed to this, where we make the same figure. Um, we do it in a little bit different order, so the instant 3D stuff works. Um, so this time we'll, we'll extrude out the block, and then we'll make the feature a separate cut. Um, but it's, it's really the same geometry to start with. So here I'm putting a new sketch on that face, going normal to that face, drawing a circle on it. Okay, this is already becoming old hat. I'm sure you guys can do this with your eyes closed. Um, so we do a little cut, and we tell it to go through all. Okay. <clears throat> all right, but now watch. We take this hole, we start dragging it around a little bit. Right there. We have new edges, we have new vertices, we have new faces, right? Because think about how the mapping was before, and now we have more faces than we used to have. How do you map those new ones? What happened to the old ones? So that's a topologic, topologically different body, and that's what you're really struggling with to try to keep SolidWorks and basically all geometric type of programs happy, is to maintain those, those mappings and those dependencies. So does that make sense? Okay. All right, so it's time to build a cannon here. I think we're on time. This is the fastest one ever, 30 slides in 50 minutes. It's pretty good. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're building three parts and um, I couldn't find, I wish I could find something that had actually some dimensions but I looked at the figures and tried to get it kind of roughly to scale. So it has a 16 inch diameter gun, right? And it's, it's a 50 caliber, so it's about 50 times, the, the barrel length is about 50 times the diameter. And so 50 times 16 is actually 800, but um, when I looked up online it said it was actually 68 feet, so that's 816 inches. And the rest of this stuff is just scaled to look about the right size with it. Um, so recall that a guy could stand in here. Just, just keep in mind the scale of things. This is a nice little toy cannon on our page, but so it's it's 108 inches tall. What is that? About nine feet, something like that. Yeah, nine feet. So that's 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 how big this is. Okay. Um, so let's let's start doing this thing. I'll save this. Okay. So there's tons of different ways that you could go about making this thing. I'm going to make it in a straightforward way just to be simple about it. Um, so I'm going to start on the front plane. I'm going to make the first little circle here a uh, construction line. So a construction line, what that means is that when you use it to cut or extrude out something, the construction lines are ignored. Um, that way it doesn't become an edge used by the feature. And I want to make a construction line, a uh, construction circle, I guess, that's, six, that's 16 inches. You'll see why I do this in a little bit. It's 16 inches in diameter. And it's centered on the origin, so it's all black now, fully defined. And then I'm going to make the next barrel. And I needed something to make this dimension off of. That's why I made that circle. And so how thick do you think we should make the outer part of the barrel? How many inches thick of steel should we make on this thing? Usually quite a bit thicker than the diameter of the chamber of the barrel. So I think so? So if it was, well, if we made it the same thickness, that's what that would look like. It seems very fat to me, but you might be right. I don't know. Um, how, how about eight? 
I hear you. I mean, you, we've got to have enough strength, and hopefully we get to the FEA at the end. We see if we can, what would actually happen with our cannon if it would blow up or not. Um, it's kind of a fun study to look at real quick. Uh, so let's let's just try eight. Um, my original one had like two, but I agree with you, Brent. It seems like it needs more meat than that. Okay, so we know that we want this, we wanted it to be 816 inches long, right? So I'm not going to worry about the actual bore right now. I'm just going to let this be solid. And I'm going to make it blind, 816 inches. Okay. So it builds the geometry. I'll press F, which is fit. And that will zoom out so we can see the whole thing. Okay. Now I'm going to go back to this face that we started working on. Uh, I'm going to turn off Instant 3D just because I don't need it. And I'm going to start another sketch on that face. Um, I don't know if you guys recall, um, but there is... So I'm going to go normal again. Um, start another concentric circle. And there were kind of stages to the barrel. Like it was thicker in the back and it got thinner as it went out. So um, here's the next stage, and maybe, I don't know, what do you think, four or five inches of steel, something like that? I don't, I don't make cannons all the time. I don't know how big this ought to be, but we'll just, we'll just eyeball it. That's going the wrong direction, so we can drag this. We'll put it maybe halfway or so. Say OK. Starting to look a little bit like, uh, like a cannon, right? Okay. <clears throat> we could do that again, but just so that you get used to what some other things look like, um, let's go on the right plane and we'll do a revolve this time. So now we're looking at it this way. And we will take a square. Actually, well, center lines or, or construction geometry is also used to figure out what to rotate around. So maybe this one will be, oh, maybe five, another maybe six inches, let's say. Okay. Now here, we still have one degree of freedom left. Maybe we'll make this a uh, certain dimension off of that front edge. So, you know, as you see what I'm doing here, I'm establishing, implicitly, I'm establishing dependence on other geometry that was before me. Um, so let's say that's 240. So that's 20 feet. <laughs> Just <to laughs> 240 inches. Okay, so I'll go to features. I'll do a revolve base. And It'll look and see, well, you only have one center line, and that's a simple closed figure. I know what to do. And I, I want to merge the results, so I want to merge all the bodies together, not have two bodies interfering with each other, and go full 360 degrees. So I'll say OK. OK, perfect. Now, <clears throat> I have, looks a lot more like a cannon, but we have to remember, we need something to pivot this cannon on in the back, for elevation, so we kind of need a like a shaft coming out of the side, and we also need something to mount the cannon on, like face-wise. So we need some kind of more square geometry that hooks up to it. So let's start off this face again, and we'll start a new sketch there. <clears throat> so I'm going to start another square. Get escape a couple times. Put a center line from this center point to this center point and make that vertical. So now it will stay centered. And how about, I don't know, I'm sure 36 is good. And we want to make it bigger than the can. How about 64? And then maybe overall length. So you noticed how that was all blue and we started making it black. Uh, five feet, maybe? No. Make it about the same height as I am. I'm 
not 62, I'll make it 74. <laughs> okay. So I have a choice of which, which way I want to do this. And I can drag it around or I can set the, you know, set the numbers in here. I think I'll just drag it. Yeah, sure. Another 74 inches, maybe. And I'm going to merge the result again, so it's combining all this geometry together. <clears throat> okay. So now this is what the can looks like. So I'm going to start a new sketch on this face. And go normal to that face again. And I will put a whole... Actually, I don't want to put a hole. This is going to be a boss. Um, yeah, I'll just dimension it. What is the whole boss? What is the boss? Yeah, what? It's a uh, you're. It's instead of it's adding geometry instead of subtracting geometry. So you're you're creating like a, an extrusion off of something. That's. I don't, I don't have a more technical definition than that. <laughs> so let's make a 20 inch pin off of this thing. Nice big deal. And we'll make it 30 inches down. And we'll make it 40 inches from the back. Yeah, OK, that's good. <clears throat> So now I'm going to do an extrude boss base. That seems like kind of a lot. How about 20 inches? How about 30 inches? Okay. Good. All right. All right. And I want to do exactly the same thing on the other side, but why would I want to? I just said what I wanted to do, right? So um, in order to actually do that, I can use a mirror feature. To, to mirror the feature. You know what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> so in order to do that, I, I could use some of my existing reference geometry. I guess the right plane would work just fine. But I want to show you that you can create your own reference planes. So I'll make my own. And by clicking on two faces, it'll, and if they're parallel, it'll assume, oh, you won't, probably want something directly in between them. So I'll create that new reference plane. That becomes a new feature in our tree here. And now, if I highlight that feature and that plane, just hold, hold down control and highlight them both. I come up here and drop down. You can see there's lots of different things, linear patterns, circular patterns, curve driven, there's tons of different things, but we're just going to use a mirror. And it previews, that looks about right. Okay, cool. Okay, so the last thing we have to do is actually cut the bore. So we'll do that. And actually, we already created the geometry we wanted for the bore, so let's just show this one. And we can click on that, <clears throat> on that uh, sketch line, and use this Convert Entities button. And that will map a new entity just like it into this sketch. So this is super helpful, especially if you have some complex bunch of curves. You don't want to go trace them all out. You can just click on them and say convert, and it just pops it right in. So I'll click on that. There it is. Use extrude cut. Say through all. Okay. We have a pretty mean looking cannon. All right. So I'm going to call this barrel one. <coughs> Um, something that we'll look at a little bit later, you can assign materials which have implied densities. So if we, if we make this out of plain carbon steel, um, we can do some evaluative kind of things and ask how much this weighs. Any guesses before I show you how much this weighs? <laughs> 68 feet long. Just shoot in the dark. How, how, how big do you think this thing is? 30 tons? Any other guesses? How much do you think? I really have no idea. 
I did. I'll say 31. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's cheap, but Gary, what are you going to do? <laughs> you better not say 32. <laughs> huh? 50? Okay. All right. <clears throat> so this is 312,000 pounds. So that's 150 tons. That's a big, there, there were three of these. <laughs> I don't know if we have exactly the right geometry, but that, I mean, it's big. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, I was off by a bit when I was guessing, too. Okay, so we'll save that. <clears throat> now, we need to create something to mount this into, right? So, we'll click on new and create a new part. Do you know how accurate that Oh, oh, as far as the algorithm goes? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty, um, probably pretty, pretty accurate. It's pretty accurate. There's two modes. There's really accurate mode and not as really accurate mode. <laughs> and I've never seen either of them quantified. Um, but I... I'm just wondering how accurate those are. Probably, probably about 30 times. Yeah, well, it's, it, yeah. Um, yeah, it's definitely more than five or six decimals. Uh, it's, it's, I don't know the exact number though. Um, so, <clears throat> let's switch back here and just remind ourselves how big this thing is supposed to be. So we need to make this little box looking thing. Maybe we could add some cool looking features. I made it boxy so it was easier to see in the drawing. But we need to make, it might be easiest to just draw this profile and extrude it out, right? So as you start to use SolidWorks, you start to look for symmetry and say, how would this be easiest to represent? Minimum number of features, maybe. Because you could draw a box and then cut that out. That's another way you could do it. But I'm going to draw from this perspective. So it needs to be 700 long and 108 tall with a 45 degree angle to make that. So sketch, I'll go to the front face, sketch. Do -do -do -do. As I'm going here, it's it's getting some uh, implied. See, these are horizontal, vertical, horizontal. I'll right-click and drag up. Gets you the Smart Dimension tool. Click on those two and make it 45 degrees. And this was 700. Hit F to fit it. Oh man! <laughs> Zoom in here. And make that 108. Okay. Uh, I don't remember how wide it was though. Let's look back at that. Where'd you go? 400 wide. So that's how far I'm going to extrude it. Okay. Okay. Another question. How much armor do we give the guys in the house up there? Because <laughs> we, you know, we don't want little fighters to come by and shoot holes in them, and then we can't use our 16-inch guns. So we're going to shell this thing. But actually, before we shell it, we need to add a little thing on the bottom here. Let's do that first. Uh, so be thinking about your best guess for shelling. I'm going to add a little. Center line, and a circle, and I think, I don't remember, how big was that? 450, okay, that's how the diameter of this thing. Four, five, zero. And how about, we'll go 300 back. Did not. Yes, I did. 120 down. So there's another story, 10 foot ceiling, <laughs> right there. <laughs> I can't remember what the names of these things are, but go down 120 inches. <clears throat> okay. All right. So what's the vote? How much uh, plate armor are we going to give these guys? 
Five inches? Okay. Five inches it is. Who wants to guess how much this weighs? <laughs> uh, I'm also going to add... <laughs> that this is uh, faces to exclude or to remove. So I'm going to take that out. And then when I hit go, you can see it kind of shells everything but removes that face. That way you don't have to go cut it out later. Okay, let's, I'm just curious. I don't remember how big this is. How much? 500,000. Okay, we'll make it out of steel again. I don't know if... They make it out of some kind of steel, but I don't know the exact kind. Um, this one weighs... Oh, man. One million pounds. <laughs> One million. All right, that's a big, <laughs> that's a big turret. There are three of these on the Iowa. <laughs> there are three of these million pounds. Oh man. Okay. Uh, now we need a plane out here a little ways. We need to cut a hole for the turret to go through, like a little slot. So let's. Go off of the right plane. Looks like that'll work right off the edge there. So I'll start a new sketch there. I'm a little disoriented. Okay. I'm on the wrong side. <laughs> okay, I think it's like 15 degree increments if hit the arrow over key. So you can get around to where you want it to be. All right, so I'll use the little uh, slot tool. SolidWorks is kind of interesting with, with these sort of things because it creates higher level sketch features with basic sketch entities. So this really, it's a slot sketch, but it's really two lines and two arcs, and then a center line. So um, you can do all the same stuff you could do with those things. So we'll center this, same as, you end up doing this all the time. Let's, one of the reasons I wanted to show you guys how this works. Um, using geometry, uh, construction geometry to center things up. Um, okay, now, I'm trying to remember how thick that barrel was in the back. Anybody remember? It was like... Click on that, and then go to evaluate and measure it. And it says the diameter um, in meters. I would like to know in inches, please. Go to inches. Here's our accuracy level. I guess there's three now. <laughs> so we're using the fastest one, though. I don't know how big that is. <laughs> uh, 54 inches is the diameter there. So to make this a little bit bigger, we'll make it 56. <laughs> ah, shoot. Yeah. <laughs> 56, okay. All right, ready? Oops, can't drag that. Okay. Say 38, and I'll show you something else here. It defaults to the center point, but if you just accept whatever that is, leave this highlighted, you can go over here to the leaders and say, I don't really want to talk about the uh, center point. I'd like to talk about the minimum condition. And then you can define what you want at a minimum. Say I want one inch at minimum. Good. Now I have that fully defined. I can extrude cut. That's the wrong direction. So cut in. And you know, I think one inch was not a good idea because it's going to cut into our armor there. So how about six inches? 
we get above our five inch plate. Um, <clears throat> the little stoplight is rebuilt, so that goes back and generates the geometry again. Okay, now we're just about done. We need a place for that those 20 inch pins to pivot on. Um, and I'm not going to build all the geometry, but I'm going to just show you the idea um, just due to time. Uh, I'm just going to cut some holes in this, and we're going to pretend there's, obviously you wouldn't build it this way, but just for time. We're going to pretend that we're just going to put a big shaft through the thing on both sides. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> okay, now we can, this is 20. <clears throat> Five sounds good. And um, maybe 10. Okay, and yeah, maybe 50. Yeah. Okay, very good. Okay, and the last little bit. So we have our, oh, this is the sketch. We need to cut it out. So do an extrude cut and we'll say through all. So now we kind of have a, a shaft hole that we can connect these two things up with. And we'll save that as the turret. And last little thing, one more part. Three hundred tall, four hundred and fifty in diameter. So this is an easy one. We'll start on the top plane this time and make a circle 450 in diameter. Extruded 300 up. Shelled, how much armor do we give these guys? Five again, or okay. And then we'll we want them to be able to get out of that turret, so we'll cut out the top of this thing. I guess they can't get out of the bottom, but they're stuck in a little pen in there, I guess. Okay, uh, so we'll this is good enough. We'll just call we'll this the door. The side. <laughs> okay. Let's, we'll put a door just to be nice. Uh, what's a typical door height? Eight feet? Maybe seven feet? Okay, seven. This is kind of a cool thing. You can actually put units in. So, so apostrophe is feet. Seven feet by, I don't know, 34 inches or something. That's what sticks in my head. That's a reasonable size door, I guess. Not huge. Um, okay. Now they can get out. <laughs> there we go. Now we have a door. Okay, so we'll save that. All right, now... <clears throat> Let's switch back to our slides. We have all the pieces. Um, and just like we had abstractions of functions in, Sim in MATLAB and abstractions of subsystems in Simulink, SolidWorks, one of the biggest abstractions is subassemblies. And so subassemblies are made up of other subassemblies and parts, just like subsystems are made up of other subsystems and blocks. Stick with me. And uh, so we'll create uh, an assembly document. And it's the same kind of thing, just like you gather a whole bunch of parts together, or a whole bunch of blocks, and say, put these in a subsystem. You do the same thing in SolidWorks. And highlight the parts and say, I really want this to be a subassembly. So now I'm, I'm beginning the subassembly, and we're going to start with the base. We'll, we'll just pin this here so it doesn't go away. And we'll drop it on there. And then we'll put the turret on top of that. And we'll put the barrel here. Say okay. Oh, I 
forgot to tell this what it was made out of. That's why it's the wrong color. So, we like, see how much it weighs. yeah, we got to see how much it weighs. <laughs> this is a big one. It's 300 inches tall. So, any bets? <laughs> uh, mass properties. This one is 2.8 million pounds. That is big. What did I read that wrong? Mass. Oh, you're right. 800,000. <laughs> Much smaller. <laughs> you're right. Thank you. Uh, small 800,000. 400 tons. Okay. So, okay. So, I'm just going to take a drink here real quickly. Now, <clears throat> in sketches, we had constraints, right? We had constraints geometrically, we had constraints dimensionally, and we could push and pull that sketch within our degrees of freedom. Okay. So, in the assembly, we have exactly the same analogs. So this has a little F by it, which means it's fixed. Um, so that's sort of anchored in space, and that's just the default. The very first part you drop into an assembly, it assumes it probably doesn't want that one to float, so it fixes it. But you can fix or float any part. Um, so if I take this turret, I can drag it, I can rotate it. So I'm left clicking to, to move and right, left clicking and dragging to move, right clicking and dragging to rotate. Um, so this has six degrees of freedom right now. And this has another six, so I guess there's 12 degrees of freedom in the system at the moment. And we need to get it down to two, right? So, <clears throat> one thing that's pretty obvious is we would like this and this to be concentric. So they move on that same plane. So before I do this, how many degrees of freedom is that going to eliminate? Any guesses? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you you be left with or you constrained to? Okay, so let's let's try it. Um, so with mates, that's what they're called in assembly land. Um, you click on geometry instead of sketch segments. So I clicked on this face and I'm going to click on this face and it said okay I have two cylindrical faces you probably want a concentric mate which we do and so that's what's highlighted here and we'll say okay. All right so now we have one degree of freedom this way and one degree of freedom this way. So we had six now we have two, so eliminated four. But we still we don't we don't have a pop up turret, so we need to constrain one more. Uh, we can do that with a coincident mate. So we'll click on this face, click on this face, and then check. Okay, and now. That rotates kind of like we'd like it to, which is good. All right, um, and you can see there's a little minus next to it. Come on, there's a little minus. That just means it's underdefined, which is fine. We, we're going to actuate it inside Simulink, so we don't want it to be fully defined. If you completely locked it in, then the minus would go away. But we want we want to have that single degree of freedom for that. Okay, now we want to get this part over here. So I'm going to click on a face and drag it, and middle clicking and dragging to rotate. So when you think about stuff inside SOLIDWORKS, there's the camera position and the part position. So you're sort of moving your position, and right? So I'll right click and drag on the part to rotate it around, just kind of get it roughly where I want it. And the first thing um, that I'll do, I want it to get centered um, on in this slot. And so I'll use um, a different kind of mate to do that. Um, it's not one of the standard mates. I'll just roll that up. Come on, roll up. There you go. 
it's an advanced mate, and there's this thing called width, which is fantastic because that's exactly what we want it to do. Um, so there are two boxes, one for the width selections and one for the tab selections. So all I have to do is pick on those two for the width. It's just going to center between those two things. I'll right click to say OK. Alrighty. So now, now how many degrees of freedom does this have? This barrel, I mean. Um, assuming the turret was locked, what can the barrel do? It can move in the plane of the turret and it can rotate in that plane also. So it has three and we want to eliminate two of those so it can just elevate or not. So what we're going to do is use that geometry. Yep. Make it eccentric with this. And I'll zoom out so you can see if that looks halfway right. Have a little bit of interference here. Hmm. Maybe we should make this a little bit bigger. You can just scoot your whole back to the top of Yeah, I could do that. That's a good idea. So I double clicked, double click on that dimension. I don't know, maybe we'll go 30 inches back, 140. Okay. So nothing changed because I need to rebuild. So I click on the rebuild button. No topological changes, only parametric, and moved through and solved everything. Now we have a cannon that can change this, change our bearing. We have a good looking cannon. Now, if you were to click the drag, could you pull it all the way up vertical? And it just not the really not able to go through the. Um, yeah. Yeah, it would, it would go right through. Um, you can turn on, if you go to the move, uh, move component, you can turn on collisions. And so if we just turn on detection, for example, it won't stop it. But it'll tell us what's colliding. Oh, that one actually, oops, I had stop at collision. So if I turn that off, then it'll just tell us what's colliding. So I'm going to save this, and I'm going to save all, and I'm going to call it gun assembly. Okay. And there's this sketch that's still showing here. Um, that's because we never we never hid this one that we. So that's the base in the uh, barrel. Remember this guy, we, we showed this so we could convert the entity. We need to hide, hide it just so it's not ugly. That'll be good. All right, so I don't know. Why don't we just add a couple things just so this doesn't look so blocky. It's no good if you just make stuff ugly, you know? Like, you should at least have some level of style. Um, so let's go back in time to here and just add a few things. Maybe we'll add a, a few fillets. So features, fillet. Um, so maybe a 20 inch fillet. Yeah, this thing is so big it's... I'm just trying to Give this a little bit more something. Maybe this edge too. <laughs> I don't know, it looks a little bit goofy, but maybe I'll turn it down just a little bit.
forward in time again. Hopefully we didn't break anything. Nope, we're good. Okay, so let's save that. We'll go back to the assembly. All right, that looks a little bit better. So we'll save that. And that's all we were going to do for the project part, uh, which I'm super excited we can to talk a little bit about FEA. Um, so if you guys ever heard of FEA, FEM, finite element method, finite element analysis, okay. Just curious, what context, or have you used it before? Or? It's needed to do like stress analysis, but right. we've never really done it. At least we saw it. Okay, okay. We did some really ancient programming with uh, Windows 3.1 machine and a Turing file. Wow. Hmm. Big win. Well, this is going to look really easy then. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So let's go back to the slides here. So we kind of already did this part, the assemblies. Oh, um, thus far, I have not been able to import the full, I think it's a scale thing, um, because I, I don't know what it is, but the, the add-in for Simulink multibody doesn't want to export something that's 20 miles long. I'm not sure why. Um, I'm talking to uh, MathWorks about it, but. Um, we'll see. So we may not be able to actually see the ship and the sea, but we're at least going to have the turret. Um, but assuming we can, I just wanted to point out where I got the RLA Burke model. It was from grabcad.com, and they have like over a million models. You can sign up for free, and you can download them for free, and it's really awesome. Um, there's lots of other places. There's, uh, what's it called? SolidWorks Central, I think? Is another place you can get models, but there's lots of different places. Um, GraphCAD just tends 3D to content central. 3D content. Thank you, 3D content central, um, where you can go get stuff. And I, I point this out here uh, because just like with code or with something else, if someone's already done it, <laughs> you're wasting your time. Like go get it, unless you're trying to learn something. Um, so that someone had already built the R labor class model close enough. And so I did download it, and um, it's pretty good. I just had to rescale it. There's a scale feature inside SolidWorks. You import the geometry, and I put a slide in about this. It, they export it in the stereolithography format. You just need to set an option to make sure that you import stereolithography as a solid body and not as something else. Um, and you just scale the ship up so it's 500 feet long or so. Um, but we're not going to do that today because it's, it's pretty boring. And, guys be able to figure it out. So uh, FEA or FEM, <clears throat> what is it? It's a numerical technique to solve boundary value problems for partial differential equations. That's kind of a mouthful. But, um, so remember we were, when we introduced Simulink, we talked about how it's a general purpose ODE solver, or ordinary differential equations, so differential equations of one variable. Um, FEA and FEM, that they, it's a method to solve um, differential equations of multiple variables. And so it's really nice, I think, uh, a really nice complement to talk about it as we talk about Simulink and ODEs. And we're kind of trying to collide all these worlds so you can kind of see how they're connected. Um, and I, I can't remember your name. I know you told me. Matt. Um, Matt was saying that his, his uh, contact, contact with it before has been in stress analysis, which is probably the most widely, you know, used reason, but they use it for all sorts of things. Um, and so like structural analysis, thermal analysis, fluid dynamics, electromagnetics, like all over the place. I mean, it's super, super general. And basically what it does, it's, it's one of those, it's like calculus. It's like a really dumb idea that's really, can be really complicated, right? Um, it seems to me like when people teach calculus, they should start out by saying, this is a dumb idea. We have a complex problem, we're going to cut it up and make it really simple. We have a whole bunch of little simple things. We're going to add them up. And, you know, you get these great things from it. FEA works the same way. And so what it does, it takes complex geometry or boundary conditions and breaks them up into small little tiny chunks and then solves them in, guess what, matrices. And then as there's a lot of different pieces of software and different modes of that software, and then you can go back and post-process all of that data to see 
how did air flow through this uh, room? Or, you know, <clears throat> what, I have some examples here. How did air flow around this bicycle helmet? Or when these two gears meshed here in the upper right hand corner, uh, where, was, it, was it almost breaking or was it strong enough? You know, you can see like where these gears are meshing. There's this contact and we're transferring a lot of stress right through here. And you can see back where it's transferring torque into the shafts. Now there's more stress here and not as much here. This is not the kind of thing you'd want to do by hand. I mean, this is hundreds of thousands of equations that it's solving simultaneously. Um, this one on the right is actually a project that I did a couple of years ago um, for a, it's like 35 foot uh, tall agricultural, like uh, for almond hulls, a silo, um, which I thought was going to be an easy problem, but ended up not being an easy problem because of the way uh, composite materials sit in silos. Um, it's not like the way you'd think maybe water, I thought of it at first as like water. So if you're making a tank for water, you know, you figure out what's the density of water and then all that can push uh, like pressure wise out the bottom, right? Um, but actually it's not nearly like that because you, you, if you had to make water tanks 30 feet high, they'd be super, super thick. Um, so this is really thin material, like 10 gauge, just like a little over eighth inch thick. And, and you can see these little indentations. I'm, I'm telling you about this because, of, so you can see what you're looking at. So th these are uh, corrugations, these little, um, little dents. Ah, where's my mouse? These little dents. So what you're seeing is the stress response to the pressure of the material pushing outwards. So that's why it's higher stress right here at the corners. And then there's crossbars at these places and it's bulging out between the crossbars. So very sophisticated, not, not the silo, but I mean the, the technology to solve the si uh, these kind of problems. Are, you know, this one had a couple million degrees of freedom. Um, and that's, so the, the matrix had a couple million by a couple million, you know, a couple million rows by a couple million columns. Um, so it's big. Um, you, you definitely you spend years, lifetimes, trying to solve this kind of stuff by hand. Uh, so anyway, this is this is the kind of stuff it solves, and that's that's the whole point of this slide. So um, what do we need in order to do FEA? Well, we need some geometry, which we just happen to have. Um, we need some boundary conditions, which is sort of how you hold it, or what you're pushing on, or how you know maybe there's a pressure and it's causing flow through, or maybe there's a voltage and it's causing current. All these sort of things. Uh, we need some connections. So if you have multiple parts, are they welded together? Do they, can they disconnect from each other? Um, we need to be able to mesh the thing and that's where it gets cut up and I'll, I'll show you this. Um, and then we need a solver to solve the mesh and we need to be able to post-process the results. That's kind of the nuts and bolts of it. Um, and there's, there's lots of um, tutorials and things on YouTube that you can go watch if you're interested uh, in more than this, but we're going, you know, <laughs> 80 miles an hour through this at 30,000 feet, so try to capture what you can. Um, so I was thinking about this, and I was thinking, what would be something that's relevant to our problem that you could kind of see an application of FEA with something that we have here? And SolidWorks, uh, the student edition actually has way more than the version of SolidWorks that I have, but I can do static analysis. And static analysis is essentially taking time out of the equation and saying, if I just, like if I take a pen, if I take a pen, and take this pen and say, I'm going to hold this and then apply a load right here, and then there, you know, no time is no longer a thing, so it's it's going to vibrate a little when I first put the thing on, and finally it's going to settle down. And then I want to know how much stress is there and how much displacement, how much is it going to bend, um, all that kind of stuff. What, what are the stresses and the strains? That's what static analysis is. And I was thinking, well, you know, it would be kind of cool to see because we have an energy conversion problem with a cannon, right? We fire, and then we take all this gunpowder, and it gets converted to, I don't know actually what that gets converted to chemically, but anyway, it's something else that expands, right? And we're going to convert all of that potential energy into a whole bunch of kinetic energy in this big 2,500-pound shell. And so I thought, well, we have to have like a chamber, right? And we designed a super strong chamber. Uh, to do this energy conversion because we've got to hold on to the thing while it's getting the, getting the, getting the shell going. 
So here's some boundary conditions, and um, we know that our muzzle velocity is somewhere around 2,500 feet per second, and we know that the shells are around 2,500 pounds each, and so kinetic energy of, of something is one half mass times velocity squared. Um, so just converting over to SI units, that's 11, a little over 1,100 kilograms, 762 meters per second squared. So when you crank the numbers, that's 329 millijoules or megajoules. So it's a decent amount of energy that we have to do something with. Um, so the way we calculated the kinetic energy was a mass times the velocity squared, right? But another way to think about energy is force through a distance. You're just really you're just reassociating things. Instead of saying the mass times the velocity squared, you're saying the, the force through a distance. But it's the same. Dimensionally, it's exactly the same, right? It's still energy. Um, so if you <clears throat> we're trying to map this into boundary conditions we can actually place on the cannon, we are needing to actually expand the cannon out in response. And this, this, this shell is going to try to accelerate forward. But until it finishes accelerating forward, the, the uh, chamber, inner bore, is going to have this outward force on it. And so that outward force, um, and I'll do this real quick, uh, is going to be progressively it's going to start back here where we load the shell in, and then as this accelerates, it's going to be everything behind the shell, right? So I just took the first stage to give it a fighting chance and said, okay, we know we have uh, 329 megajoules, and maybe we can deflect the, the bore walls. I just picked the number because we have to start somewhere and iterate. Let's say we can deflect the walls by 100,000, which is probably too much. Um, so <clears throat> the reason I did this is I needed a force to apply, a boundary condition to apply. So I took 300, <clears throat> I took 100 thousandths, or 0.1 inches, converted that to meters, and uh, said, okay, if I have this much energy and I displace it by this much, then that's this force. So you follow what I'm doing, right? I'm, I'm just converting back around to, to an actual load I can give the program. Um, and then we can check the displacement. Did it actually move that much? And multiply the displacement times the force we put in and see, oh, OK, that's too much or that's not enough. And we'll adjust it until we get it. Does this sound familiar at all, like as far as what we were just doing with elevation, where we take a shot, see how far it went, and then take an, I mean, this is all over the place. Um, and this is actually. Uh, there are iterative solvers for FEA, which are usually one of the fastest. <laughs> Instead of just directly solving, oftentimes they'll, they'll use iterative solvers for certain kind of problems. So, okay, let's talk more action. So we're going to take this guy and conduct a little FEA. We actually made ours a whole bunch thicker than I made mine, so um, it'll probably do a bit better. I'll hide this guy. <clears throat> uh, one thing I need to do, I need to, the barrel is a single face, and I need to split the face so that I can apply the load just to the back. Um, <clears throat> so what I'll do there is I'll do a sketch on the side. <clears throat> this will seem a little bit weird, but bear with me. Taking off? All right, thanks for being here. Yeah, I'll see you later. Okay. Um, so I just clicked on that line and that edge. Oops, I didn't mean that face. I will use this edge. And I'll make them collinear. And then I'll take this and use a split line feature. So it's going to take this profile and project onto that face and split the face by it. So now I'll have one face that's over here and another face that's the other part of it. And now I have geometry that I can apply a load to. Does that make sense? All right, good. 
That's all I have to change for the, for the geometry. Now, I will turn on SolidWorks simulation. And upgrade, I guess. Maybe we'll study. <clears throat> okay, so I just created a new study, and I have this study called Static One. And kind of like we were talking about, we have geometry. It's using material definition of plain carbon steel. We don't really need any connections because we just have one part. Uh, SolidWorks divides boundary conditions into fixtures and loads, so. Uh, we know what our load is going to be. I think we calculated that. So we were going to start with a 1.296 gigajoule or giganewton load, right? 1.296 E12. So let's do that first. Put a force. SI 1.296 E12. And that's good. I'll say OK. So now I have one external load. And um, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's not going to force the model to go anywhere, really, because it's just pushing out. But we still have to hold on to the model somewhere. So we're basically going to hold on to the tip because that would have the least interaction with what we're working on. So we're going to add a fixed geometry right here. Just so it doesn't go anywhere in space so it can get a nice clean solution. And so we have, now we're holding on to it, we have an external load and we need to create a mesh and so they have automatic meshers here. And we can do that really easily. We'll just turn it up a little bit and say OK. So it goes through and splits up the geometry we've created. And uh, I'll zoom in here so you can see it. So it made a whole bunch of little tetrahedrons. Have you guys seen this? I'm sure you've seen it someplace, right? Um, so this now approximated the geometry with all these little tiny, simpler tetrahedrons. And so we can apply more complex loads and it'll solve all these tetrahedrons as a system. Um, so we have everything we need now. Um, now we just need to we'll save it real quick and we will solve it. Come on. Run. so easy to look at when it's distorted that far, so I'll turn the distortion down a little bit, make it true scale. We'll look at it in terms of PSI, because that's how I think about stress. Okay. But the key thing here is we want to look at displacement, and we want to look at it, um, we'll turn that down to not quite so distorted, and we'll look at it not in meters, but yeah, in meters rather. And uh, also, we just want to know on the y-axis. So the resultant displacement on the y-axis. Okay. The last thing, we'll just chop this so we can see the section. And uh, we'll create a section view, not on the front plane, but on the, I think it's the right plane. Okay, so this is kind of cool looking, right? You can see our Y displacement 
And here, the positive numbers and the negative numbers make sense because it expanded away from the center of the bore. And you can see the load pushing outwards. All right, so we'll just we'll calculate one, um, and then I'll I'll show you kind of where I ended up, just so that we don't yeah, I don't know ten iterations you can get somewhere, but it's really boring to do ten times. So I'll cut to the chase. Um, Okay, so 1.296E12, that was our load, and our maximum displacement was 3.125E minus 1. So that would be a lot more. Um, well, actually, 400,000, 4.05. E9 is still about 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 times too much energy. So we have to iterate and decrease our load and watch our displacement until we actually converge on the right energy. Um, so just to save some time, I'll, I'll show you what, what happened with this one. So we held on to it. We already did that part. And these were the six iterations I did a little earlier. And my first, my first one ended up, you know, the target was uh, about 350 megajoules, wasn't it? Right around there, 330. And so my first iteration was this, and I got a large number, a bunch of gigajoules, and then I went too small. So, I mean, does this sounded all like control systems to you. If you think about the solution, <laughs> we're we're converging on something. We overshoot it a few times, um, and I got. So where I figure it's close enough, it was within a few megajoules <laughs> of the solution. Um, and that gave us a reasonable load, okay? Okay, so, <clears throat> and we are, have already seen some of these visualizations, um, but we want to know what stress was happening. Like, how much stress did that put on the barrel? Because if, if that's the amount of energy we're working with, the barrel has to hold up. And we, we have some material definition for the barrel. Um, so I want to point something out here. This shows a yield strength of 3.1 E4. So we just pretended the barrel was made out of mild steel. Probably in reality it was made out of something like a normal gun would probably be three or four times stronger uh, gun barrel. But um, it's, a, it's a place to start. And we looked at our factor of safety here, and it's about 1 40th. So factor of safety of one is like the absolute minimum. You need to, you really want it like factor of safety of 1.5 or two or three, you know, up there. We're at 140th. Um, so even if we multiply and say um, we're using much stronger steel, then we're still at 110th. So, okay, what if <laughs> you know, I, I got to thinking about this. Well, how, how does this actually work then? Because it would seem like the whole end of the cannon would blow off, right, in the guy's faces or something. Um, because it, not that our geometry was perfect, but it wasn't that much bigger or smaller than what we're doing. We're kind of in the ballpark. And this is like an order of magnitude at least off. Um, so, you know, just to be fair, the problem is that you, you are accelerating this, and we have to take, there are more dynamics than we're capturing, but I just want us to keep it simple. We're trying to accelerate the shell, and it's moving, so some of the energy is going into the shell, not all of it's going into the cannon. And as the shell moves through the barrel, there's dynamic conditions on the barrel, right, as it expands out, and so we just constrained it to a particular place in time, a particular geometry to get a, a ballpark. Um, but as I looked into this a little bit further, this isn't the only way that they're dissipating energy in the gun. That was kind of an interesting find. Um, how else would you dissipate energy if you were designing a cannon to go on an Iowa-class battleship? How else would you dissipate energy 
other than making this thing even heavier than it is. We're already a few million pounds. Oh, shoot. I mean, yeah, any ideas? Does the fact that the gun should like recoil? Yeah, exactly. I found this picture, an old black and white picture, and you can see the, <laughs> you can see the recoil units on this. See the cylinders? And I think this is some kind of a gas chamber up here. So I, I thought that was pretty cool. We actually got to explore a little bit about why they needed that. Um, or maybe why they could make it smaller so that it didn't have to be so heavy. They, they made a recoil unit on it. So that was all the stuff I was planning to cover. But I thought that was kind of neat. Uh, I really, I, I, I kind of. I'm curious now about how this all works, which parts shift inside of the other parts, you know. Uh, but it's kind of a neat thing. Um, any, any questions or comments? Or? Okay. Yeah, well, that was it. So thanks for your attention. <laughs>